Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, everybody. My name is Ivor. I'm a rec- recovered alcoholic. I am zooming in from East Kilbride, just outside of Glasgow, Scotland. And uh, it's good to be here as I look around the room and see all the people coming in. I'm reminded of the words of Bill Wilson on page 17 of our big book. We are people who normally would not mix, and uh, that is very, very true tonight with people from all over the world gathering to uh, share experience, strength, and hope, or at least listen to one alcoholic sharing his experience, strength, and hope for the next 50 minutes or so. Not sure if we'll make the whole 50 minutes. I apologize in advance, but I'm feeling a little bit below par today. Uh, But, you know, Janesta asked me a few weeks ago, and I honour my commitments unless I really, really cannot do it. And uh, the theme that um, that uh, I chose for tonight was our very lives. And uh, that comes from the top of page 20 of our book. And it says, our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depends upon our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. And I believe that to be true. It has become my experience. But in the next wee while, I'm going to share in a general way my experience, strength, and hope, because I made a lot of mistakes in my recovery. Nevertheless, my sobriety date is July the 21st, 1984, and that is a miracle that I'm hurtling towards 38 continuous years of sobriety. Um, And that's not down to me being a strong character or uh, being strong-willed, no. It's down to the intervention of a higher power long before I had any conception of him, her, or it and uh, latterly making some good decisions and taking some right actions. But I'll come back to all of that. My uh, my home group is uh, a, an online group called Towards Emotional Sobriety. It's on a Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. Um, if the chat is opened up after I finish speaking, I'll certainly share the details of that and two other online groups that I'm privileged to do service in. Uh, one is called Study the Big Book, Live the Program on a Friday night, UK time at 10 o'clock. We're just starting Chapter 2 next week. And the other meeting is a wee meeting on a Monday afternoon at 4 o'clock called Living the Programme, where we place an emphasis on the solution. And it's especially targeted for uh, people who are new in their journey or are struggling in their sobriety. And again, if I get the opportunity, I'll share the details. But in any event, my phone number is in the participants list. And if anybody wants to follow up uh, after this uh, share, even if just to harangue me, Uh, please don't hesitate to contact me, okay? Um, Important also to say at the outset that with 65 people in the room, chances are there are a few newcomers in the meeting. And I want to address the newcomers just for a moment to say, see if this is your first meeting or you're just coming around for a few weeks or months. Please, I beg of you, do not judge Alcoholics Anonymous and what you're about to hear from this crazy Scotsman. I am just an ex-drunk who has finally found a way to live happily and contentedly sober through the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, supported by the fellowship and directed by a power greater than me that I quite happily call God today, even though I am not a religious person. I want to make that very clear. Something that I'm going to read to uh, kind of um, kick off my uh, my share and and, uh, and also uh, serve as a, a further sort of spine for my share um, actually comes from today's Grapevine. Grapevine, as most of you will know, is um, uh, A's magazine in the USA. And uh, the reading today really struck me, and it says, um, it goes as follows. My sponsor told me that if I stayed away from the first drink a day at a time and followed the suggested 12 steps, I could lead a sober life. She didn't promise me health, wealth, happiness, love, or comfort. All she promised me was sobriety. Thank goodness she didn't promise me anything else, because along the AA path, I have found sickness, death, unhappiness, and considerable discomfort. But I have also found the greatest joy, love, and happiness of my life. And, you know, I identify with that, because obviously in almost 38 years away from drinking, I've experienced pretty much everything that life can throw at you. Births, marriages, deaths, insolvency, ill health, the whole the whole gamut. And I'll touch on some of that in the next wee while. But I want to say at the outset that today, 
on July the 2nd, 2022, I am living my best life, and it's all down to Alcoholics Anonymous. Sure, I'm feeling a bit below par tonight, you know, just to, due to some physical complaints, but really that says nothing compared to the life that Alcoholics Anonymous has given me. You know, I used to get the the illusion of a good life. I used to get the illusion of feeling good. I used to get the illusion of feeling part of life in a can or a bottle of alcohol back in the day when I was a young man. But it was just an illusion. Alcohol lied to me, and I didn't understand what was going on. So I'm going to take you back, and I'm going to share in a more general way um, what I used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. Um, so please, as I was encouraged to do, look for the similarities, not the differences, because there's going to be differences. You know, look for the similarities, not the differences. And uh, and I hope to spend a fair bit of my share emphasising the solution and uh, what the, the blessings, the many, many blessings that Alcoholics Anonymous has brought into my life. My name is Ivor Davis. You will have figured out that's not a very Scottish name. In fact, if there are any Welsh members in the room, you'll think that it's more of a Welsh name. Um, and it certainly is not Scottish. And if I had a pound for every time I was asked as a child or as a teenager or even as a young man if I was Welsh or if my parents were Welsh, I would have long since retired to the Caribbean on the takings. I'm not Welsh. There's no Welsh connections whatsoever in my family. All that happened is my mother married a man called Davis, not spelled the Welsh way, D-A-V-I-S, and, uh, and obviously she took his name, and then the decision was made to call me Ivor. Why did they call me Ivor? Well, it was my mother's homage to her favourite singer, who some of the older members in the room will know, Ivor Novello, now get Lindsay's name to some music awards every year. Um, and I thought that was it, you know, that she loved Ivor Novello and she gave me his name. It was a wee bit more subtle than that. But I didn't discover this until the era of the internet because Ivor Novello was his stage name. His real name was David Ivor Davis. So this was more of a subtle wee homage to her idol. Uh, and I used to hate my name. I hated it with a passion. Now, don't get me wrong, it did not make me alcoholic, right? What makes me alcoholic is that I have a physical allergy to this stuff that when I ingest alcohol, it activates a compulsion over which I've got no control, coupled with an idea, a mental obsession that pushes out all other ideas, that the next time it will be different, the next time I'll be able to manage, control, and enjoy my drinking. That's what makes me alcoholic. But see, when I began to feel apart from society, different from um, and, and this happened long before I took a drink in my teenage years. The fact that I had this odd name didn't help, right? It just exacerbated this feeling of apartness. But for the most part, I had a very happy childhood. Um, I now live in East Kilbride, but my first 20 years were, were spent in Balach by the bonny, bonny banks of Loch Lomond that I'm sure even some of our uh, friends overseas will have heard of. And, 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 and it's a beautiful place. I had the privilege of showing a very dear friend around my hometown um, a few days ago. And I was reminded of you know just what a beautiful place it is and what a fantastic, blessed upbringing I had. But see, at the time, I, I focused on all the negatives. The negatives were that there were only four shops and I couldn't make any friends and I was miserable I didn't seem to be able to fit in um, but my mum and dad were good people really good people, pillars of the local community and they were not alcoholic, there was very little alcohol drink, drunk in the house at all um, things changed when I was at secondary school um, that's uh, high school uh, for our friends across the pond um, and I can't put my finger on a date in 1973 but at some point around the age of 13, 14 fear came into my life in a big, big way I would wake up in the morning and my first thought on awakening was oh no and my head would rush off at 100 miles an hour, projecting into the day all the terrible things that were going to happen because I hadn't done that essay or because the essay that I had done wasn't up to my perfectionist standards or because I was going to see so-and-so on the bus into school and I just didn't know what to say. People would be engaging in chit-chat, asking me if I'd watched the football or Top of the Pops or whatever, and I, I, I could never do chit-chat. I, I still struggle with it, to be honest with you, to this day. Um, it's a skill that I'm still working on. Um, so long before I took a drink of alcohol, I was restless, irritable, and discontented. 
I was a prey to misery and depression. I had acute feelings of anxiety. I just did not feel part of the human race at all. Um, and then I discovered alcohol at the age of 16. I was quite a late starter. By this time, most of my peers had discovered it at the ages of 13, 14. And because I'm not getting invited to the parties, I'm hearing all these stories, these exciting stories about who got really drunk and who fought with whom and who got off with whom and all the stuff that I'm hearing in the playground uh, on the Monday after the weekend. And I'm not part of it at all. I'm just not invited. So alcohol, I began to obsess about alcohol long before I sampled the stuff. That it, you know, it sounded like the elixir of life. It sounded as if it was going to be amazing. It was going to, and and and, and taste wise, I imagined that it must taste like the best Coca Cola. That was what fourteen year old Ivor thought alcohol was going to be like. I took my first drink at the age of sixteen. I've already told you that my mum and dad were not alcoholic, and and there was very little booze in the house. There was one of these old nineteen sixty style sideboards and at the end of it there was a wee cupboard and in the cupboard there was a couple of cans of Tartan Special or McEwen's Export beer there would be a little half bottle of either Bell's or Grouse Whiskey there would be a bottle of Warnix Advocat which is a yellow eggy mess, the only thing that my mother would drink at Christmas or New Year with lemonade and then there would be a bottle of Australian Sherry now, for my UK friends in the room, this was a bottle of cooperative Australian sherry. You know, it was really, really classy. Um, and I'm quite sure it had been nowhere near Australia. I'm also pretty sure that no grapes were involved in the production of this drink. Nevertheless, 16-year-old Ivor decided this was the best option in the cupboard. Why? Because even before I've drunk the stuff, I'm already planning ahead. I'm already thinking that I'll be able to conceal my tracks by topping up this bottle of brown, brown or green glass with, uh, with water. So immediately my relationship with alcohol is an, is an unhealthy one. It's founded on lies and deception. And let me tell you, when I took that first slug, that first taste, of co-op Australian sherry, I was severely disappointed because it tasted nothing like Coca-Cola. In fact, it was disgusting. It was horrible. Anybody that's drunk any kind of fortified wines, you know, over the years will know what I'm talking about. But all that was immediately replaced by the feeling of, oh, my God, because it went down my throat and it hit my stomach and I had this profound effect on me. This warmth emanated from my stomach and went down through my arms and down through my legs and I was able to breathe for the first time. I think I was supposed to be studying for exams and it was very, very stressful. And this stuff just had this amazing effect on me. And I decided there and then that I was going to have to develop a relationship with that stuff. Later on, you know, when I looked at our steps, our 12 steps, the second step says, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Well, without realizing it, in my living room, at, on that day, at that time, I came to believe that a power in a, in a bottle or a can could restore me to some kind of wholeness. And I then made the decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of this stuff. I was going to have a relationship with alcohol. Why did nobody tell me this stuff was so amazing? So that's what I did. I started to drink in the, in the beginning because I was underage drinking. It was very limited to begin with. But once I sailed past 18, all limits were off apart from financial. And, you know, the, 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 the illness of alcoholism, because it is an illness, crept up in me very, very slowly. It was insidious. I started off drinking on a Friday or a Saturday night. And then it became any night of the week. By the time I went to Glasgow University in 1977, there was there were all manner of reasons or excuses to drink. I got involved in politics at university. I wouldn't say which colour. Let's just say that there were a lot of demonstrations about the Prime Minister that came to power in 1979. And I was right in the thick of all that. And all the planning and the plotting around the demonstrations and the protests all took place in the bar. And suddenly I've gone from only drinking on a Friday or Saturday night to drinking during the day, even having a hair of the dog that bit me in the morning. Um, you know, and it seemed perfectly normal and perfectly natural. I um, I experimented with all manner of beers. I went through my Guinness phase. 
you know, the, the, the idea that Guinness somehow, you know, is like a three course meal is, you know, and, and you would, you would, you would watch the barman pouring it in the, in the bar and criticize them if they didn't get the head quite right. You know, I thought this was all very sophisticated, but it didn't matter. I wasn't drinking for the taste. I was always drinking for the effect. And in the end, up, it didn't matter what I was drinking. I was drinking the cheapest beer available, the cheapest spirits available, the cheapest wine available, because I needed that effect. At some point around the age of 2021, I believe that I crossed an invisible line. It might have been possible had I thought that I had a problem with my drinking, which I didn't, at the age of 2021, that I might have stopped. And I wouldn't have needed to take the actions I've taken over these last almost 40 years. But you see, everybody drank. That was my perception. West of Scotland's got a very unhealthy relationship with alcohol. I know that we're not unique in that, but it's got a very unhealthy relationship, all related to a sort of macho ego and stuff like that. Um, and I just carried on my merry way. But by the age of 2021, things are happening that I don't like. Blackouts. What's that about? How is it possible for me to start drinking and then the next day when I come to, to be told by my friends that at some point I stopped drinking beer and I moved on to perno and blackcurrant and I, then I'm dancing up in the barroom table, I'm trying to get off with a barmaid who's twice my age. How is it possible that all this happened and I have no recollection of it whatsoever? And at first I thought my pals, you know, because I did have some fair weather friends by this time, I thought that they were, they were joking with me, they were winding me up. But it happened time after time after time, and it, it disturbed me, but I just kind of shrugged it off and just accepted that as part and parcel of West of Scotland drinking culture. But what was also happening was that I wasn't able to get that sense of ease and comfort that Dr. Silkworth in her doctor's opinion talks about. That sense of ease and comfort that I used to get by taking one or two drinks, I'm not getting it anymore. I'm continuing to be restless, irritable, and discontent. And when I say restless, irritable, and discontent, it's no coincidence that the Incredible Hulk's up behind me because he is, a, he is a, 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 an emblem, a symbol of me. Uh, with and without alcohol. You did not want to make me angry, okay? I just didn't turn green. Well, sometimes I did if I drank far too much, but, you know, um, the Hulk uh, is my inner Mr. Hyde. By the time I'm in my early 20s, um, more often than not, I'm just drinking is just leading me into trouble in very awkward situations. Um, I had met a girl by this time who was to become my wife, Typically, we met um, at a party where we were both very, very drunk. Um, and within a few weeks, I was introduced to her mum and dad. And this is significant because her dad was an alcoholic. Um, everybody knew he was an alcoholic. And um, it was it was a wake-up call for me, but, you know, but, it, but it didn't really register at first. What I mean by this is that I saw so many similarities in his behaviour and his drinking with me that I thought at the age of 21, 22, that if Carol, my new girlfriend, his daughter, if she made the same connections, it might negatively inhibit my ability to drink and the frequency of drinking. So the last three, four years of my drinking career, um, I became an ever more secretive drinker because if she saw the amount that I was drinking, if she knew really the amount that I was drinking and the, and the, the, the places I was drinking, then she would not have been happy and she would have come down on me hard. So the last three, four years of my drinking, I, 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 it was very progressive. You know, I look back on it now and I can see it. I couldn't see it at the time. May 1984, I'm coming up on my 25th birthday, and uh, the well-worn routine by this time is that I would leave the pub uh, opposite where I worked um, in the centre of Glasgow, um, and I would go for a pint. I was always just going for a pint with the guys, the, the older guys that I worked with. Um, and as soon as I took that first drink, my feet were nailed to the floor. I could not move and I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand how these quite heavy drinking guys could even stop after two or three pints, look at their watch and say, right, I better go up the road for my tea. And they would leave me night after night in the bar on my own, propping up the bar. Bill Wilson in his story talks about how he would pound in the bar saying, how did it happen again? And that happened to me time after time after time. 
Um, the well-worn routine was that I would somehow get home by a, a bus or taxi to the flat in Govan Hill in the south side of Glasgow. And in order to maintain the lie that I'd only had a couple of drinks, I would sober myself up by um, uh, heating up frozen pizzas in the grill or the oven. Um, and so that when my girlfriend came home at the back of midnight, she worked in the catering industry, then I would be able to maintain the lie. And this worked many, many times. And then in May 1984, it failed spectacularly. The bits that I can remember are that uh, I'm coming to and I'm lying in the bed and I'm wearing a suit very similar to what I'm wearing here tonight. And um, and Carol's screaming at me. She's absolutely screaming at me. And there's tears running down her face. And I put two and two together very, very gradually. And what had happened was I put the pizzas on under the grill and then I completely passed out. Stocious, as we say in Glasgow absolutely paralytic, intoxicated, drunk. And she came home, fortunately, 10 minutes earlier than normal, intervention by higher power, I believe, and found the flat full of smoke and Ivor still in his suit, completely out of it, horizontal on the bed. The next morning, she did not miss me and hit the wall. She drew upon the experience with her dad that I mentioned to you. And she said, I've lived my whole life with my dad as an alcoholic. If you've got a problem with your drinking, you better sort it out now. Otherwise, you are out of here. The marriage, which was already planned for the following year, will be off. Um, and uh, you and I will be done. That's it. She gave me that ultimatum. And, um, you know, over the years, I've become more and more grateful to her for that ultimatum because that really, really shook me. It really shook me up. How did that happen? I'd just gone for a couple of drinks as normal. How did that happen? Terrified me, the prospect of uh, of her finishing the relationship. Terrified me, uh, the prospect of the marriage being off. Um, terrified me also, the prospect of not drinking. Even though I could have died in a flat fire, my head's telling me, what am I going to do? How am I going to live the rest of my young life without alcohol? And then I remembered that a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous called Matt had talked to me four or five years previously, night after night after night. This wee man would tell me that he was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and that he stayed away from one drink for one day at a time for oneself. And he told me a whole bunch of other stuff about programs and fellowship and meetings. And, and I just humoured him. I thought he was a crazy old man. I now needed to remember that. I needed to apply this one day at a time thing. You know, so just like in that grapevine reading, you know, that was the starting point by not drinking one day at a time. And you'll see in the almost, the almost 38 years that I've been around, I've been sober now, that's the only thing that I have got right 100%, that I have never drank even so much as a sip of alcohol one day at a time for almost 38 years. But you see, back then, as I, as I slipped past the age of 25 um, at the end of June in that year, I uh, I thought, well, that's it. I've got it cracked. I'm managing to not drink a day at a time. Um, that's my problem. Solution is just don't drink a day at a time. Um, and I managed to stay sober, dry, for 60 days on sheer willpower, white knuckle, gritty teeth, uh, sobriety. But, you know, um, this illness is cunning, baffling, and powerful and it centers in our minds. And my mind as a 25-year-old man is telling me, after 60 days, you see, you cannot possibly be an alcoholic. If you were an alcoholic, you would not manage to stay off it for 60 days. Anyway, anyway what alcoholic is only 25 years of age? You know, alcoholics are the guys that you see in the park benches with the beard that's not been trimmed for 10 years, with the coats, with the two bits of string. All this stuff is getting uh, is getting amplified in my head. And eventually, in the island of Crete in July 1984, I picked up the first drink. Alcohol is indeed cunning, baffling, and powerful. Because, you know, see, when I picked up that first drink, nothing terrible happened. I managed to stop after the second one. I had two glasses of ouzo, strangely one of the few drinks that I even like the taste of. I don't understand that. But um, I had two glasses of ouzo, and I was able to stop. The sky didn't fall on my head. In fact, Carol is delighted, because even though she saw me in the flat 60 days before, even though she's lived with an alcoholic father, she's saying to me, I'm so proud of you. You've done so well. 
but do you not think you could just have a wee glass of wine? It's not the same for me, you not drinking. I would far rather split a bottle. So when I had the two glasses of ouzo and nothing terrible happens, and I relax. I've been like a coiled spring for 60 days. I relax. I'm able to talk. I'm able to flip. I'm able to joke, right, with a couple of drinks inside me. And I've proven to myself and to her, can't possibly be an alcoholic, can I? Well, little did I know. You see, I'd lit a fuse, but it was on a slow burn. And the next night, the night of the 20th of July, 1984, I started to drink on the back of that um, uh, initial couple of drinks the day before, and I could not stop. And I drank the most alcohol that I've ever drank, and God willing, it'll be the most alcohol I, I will have ever drunk before I die. I started off in Uzo, went on to wine, I went on to Ritzina, Raki, Metaxa Brandy, back to Uzo. Very, very greedy drinker. The waiter could not get within 10 yards of me, but I'm ordering more drink. Carol's kicking me very hard under the table, saying, do you not think you've had enough? And I turned on her, my friend the Holt again. I turned on her and I said, this is what you wanted. Blaming her, you know. Um, I came out of a, a brownout uh, and I look around and all the companies disappeared and I've got all these glasses and bottles around me and uh-oh, it's happened again. I can't put pieces on under the grill. We're in a wee hotel room. I tried to sore myself up with lots and lots of soft drinks, but I was so drunk that I couldn't even break the seals on the Fanta or the Sprite or the 7-Up. Uh, a knife came into play, and I'm trying to, trying to break the seals with a knife. And about a, I was so drunk. The knife slid off the seal, went right into my hand, and at one point the knife is sticking out my hand, and then there was a geezer of blood, and I passed out. When I came to, I was in the shower, there's blood and water everywhere, I've got a thumping headache, I don't know whether I've been out for five minutes or two hours, but I've sobered up enough to remember snippets of what's going on in the last previous few hours, and I am more scared than I've ever been, or I've ever been since, and I don't ever want to be that scared again. It had happened again. Carol had gone off into the night very, very upset, walking around Heraclea. I don't remember any big post-mortem. There was certainly no big fight the, the, the morning after the night before. But I knew, I knew that I cannot drink with safety. Didn't understand why, but I knew. And so I started to repeat that one day at a time thing again. We got married the following year. And although I'd been in some kind of pink cloud once I'd sobered up physically, and um, I, I, I just about ruined our wedding day. Well, no, I, I pretty much did ruin our wedding day. Not because I was choking for a drink, but you see, without the solution of alcohol, I, 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 am, I am just in turmoil. I've got an inner maelstrom, an inner internal spiritual malady. I am riddled with self-centered fear. I couldn't do chit-chat. I couldn't participate in all the, you know, I couldn't be the groom that is glad-handing all the all the relatives that I've never met before. I just could not relax. And there were a few other things happened that I don't have time to go into, which just added to the stress. And I felt as if the spotlight was on me the whole time. And um, and, I, and I, I dragged my new bride away early and spoiled the wedding day for her. And that was the beginning of what I call my start raven sober period number one, because from uh, June 1985 until I finally came to Alcoholics Anonymous in October 1987, my, my life became absolutely unbearable, and I've got no idea what's going on. The, the way that I described to you how I was as a 14-year-old boy came back tenfold. I'm now 28. And I'm waking up in the morning and I've got a responsible job with a fancy job title, a big salary and a company car. And my first thought on awakening is, oh, no. And my head would race off at 100 miles an hour. And I would go into work and I would put on the mask and everybody's saying, how are you, Ivan? And I'm saying, I'm fine. And I'm not fine. I'm dying inside. I'm dying. My head's racing. My stomach's churning. I don't know what's going on. Um, the place that I worked became like AA Central. My boss had been 12 stepped in at the fellowship the year before. There's half a dozen members in the fellowship scattered throughout the building. And then we employed this wee man 
called Archie G as a part-time alcohol and addiction counsellor. And I did not know this at the time, but this man was like Glasgow's answer to Clancy I. Some of you will know who Clancy is from California. Um, and this man was like a recruiting sergeant for Alcoholics Anonymous in Glasgow. And he stuck to me like a limpet. Now, I'm, almost, I'm three years sober at this point. I'm dry, at least. And, and he would say to me, son, go to a meeting. And I would say, Archie, I don't need to go to a meeting. I'm, I'm three years sober. Uh, and, and, but I would start to tell him how I was feeling. And he would say things that seemed quite absurd, like, son, alcohol comes in cans and bottles, but alcoholism comes in people. And, and I would argue with them. How can how I'm feeling have anything to do with alcohol, Archie, uh, alcoholism? Because I, I've not had a drink. But by October 1987, 10 days before the birth of my first daughter, I, I don't know what else to do. I'm, my head is absolutely burst. My stomach is churning. I'm, I'm going to the doctor for all manner of physical complaints. I don't know what else to do, so I go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Three years and three months to the day since my last drunk in uh, the island of Crete. I'm beaten, bewildered, very, very confused. And I went to um, a meeting on the south side of Glasgow called Albert Drive Wednesday night, and I got a lovely welcome. And um, I got hope. And the thing that gave me the most hope, apart from the identification that I got with the, the two women that shared at the meeting that night, and the lovely welcome, and the cups of tea and coffee, was there was a big sign behind the speakers which said, you are no longer alone. And I loved that because I'd felt so alone, not just for the previous three years, but I'd felt so alone in my own skin for about 14 years. I'd begun to feel that like I was an alien in, a, in human form. I just felt so different from other people. I didn't seem to think like other people. And yet at this meeting, people are sharing with me their thoughts, their feelings and their emotions that only I thought I had. And they're sharing it with me, and they're calling alcoholism an illness, which centers in the mind. So I began to think that maybe, maybe Archie's no such a crazy old man after all. And I started to go to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, one, two, three a week. My first daughter was born a year and a bit later. My second daughter was born. For a while in Ivor's life, like Bill Wilson says in his story, the goose hung high. I got promoted several times in my work. Um, I've got a, a really responsible job and it's exciting. And Carla and I moved to a lovely seven apartment terrace villa in the Cathcart area of Glasgow. And outwardly, materially, we, we've got it made. But, you know, I didn't understand anything about alcoholism. I didn't understand it. And if you don't treat alcoholism, then it gets worse. My experience is it, get, it progresses whether you are drinking or you are dry. And that's what was to happen to me. You see, I kept asking people to be my sponsor. I kept joining groups. But I didn't really get why. It was just to please other people or to be able to fit in. I didn't get it. Um, I didn't get that the big book, which I bought in 1987, I didn't get that the big book contains a design for living sober. I didn't see the need for it. What I did see was the quaint language, and I just kind of discounted it, you know, partly because of that. Um, so I didn't change. And I drifted away from Alcoholics Anonymous after coming around for eight years. Um, and by this time, I'm in an intolerable work situation, um, uh, all the staff, and I mean all the staff bar one, hate me. Uh, they've taken out a mass grievance against me. It was an unbearable place to work. I have got no program. I have got no sponsor. I've got no higher power. The only time I would talk to God, as I understood him, which wasn't really, was when I would say the serenity prayer, because it, it did seem to give me some minor relief, momentary relief. Um, but I didn't have any spiritual program at all. My solution to my unbearable living problem was to throw myself into a business venture, reacquaint myself with my friend the Incredible Hulk and all these Marvel and DC comic buddies in the 1990s, and I set up a business. Um, like Bill Wilson, I imagined myself at the head of a vast enterprise, and I was going to show the world who Ivor Davis was, and I was going to be successful. I was going to be the Richard Branson of the comic retail world, and I was also going to show the Americans how to sell comic books. You know, the Americans have been doing it pretty well, but no, I, I was going to really show them. You know, egomania, right? Egomania. 
And I threw myself into this business venture so much and, and it was so seductive and so exciting that suddenly the few activities that I've been doing in AA, suddenly I've got no time to do them. I went a week without a meeting, a month without a meeting, three months without a meeting. Never meant to stop coming to AA, never meant to leave Alcoholics Anonymous, but it's my experience that I did. And it is so easy done. It's terrifying when I look back on this part of my story. I drifted away from AA, ladies and gentlemen, for eight years and two months. And I do not recommend that to anybody. If there's anybody in the room who is maybe thinking, that, you know, maybe thinking that this might be their last meeting, this Alcoholics Anonymous is not doing anything for me. I don't really get it. don't really like this God business. Please, I beg of you, stick in. Keep coming. Because it's my experience that see out there on your own, with no connection with a higher power, with no program. All I had was me and my self-propulsion, my self-will run riot. My, my life went down the toilet in the next eight years. All the things that I held dear, my marriage, the big house, the, my beautiful three kids, the business, they all went. They all went. And I'm very, very fortunate that I got back to Alcoholics Anonymous in 2003, eight years and two months after I left Alcoholics Anonymous, and everything in my life has just disintegrated around about me. People have said to me many, many times, I don't know how you didn't drink during that period. And I used to try and explain it and rationalize it. See, the honest answer is God. A power that I do not really understand. The same power that intervened in 1984 and took away the desire, the obsession to drink, because that's what happened to me, has watched over me lovingly over the subsequent years, watching and observing every mistake that I made in order to get me back to Alcoholics Anonymous, which I did in 2003. And, you know, and I want to thank the, the guys in the, the live meeting for doing the readings earlier on, because, you know, see that extract from how it works, it's very, very important to me. When I came back in August 2003, I went back to the group that I'd previously been in, and to my great amazement and surprise, the very first night I was handed the laminate sheet with that extract from Chapter 5 on it, and I was asked to read it. Now, I've not looked at any literature at this point, probably for about 10 years, and as I read it, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed their path. I realized right there and then, it was like the words flipped off the page and hit me between the eyes. I had not thoroughly followed the A's path. And, and, and I, I had failed. I hadn't drank, but I had failed. Nobody would want the sobriety I had. I had failed to live sober. I'd failed as a father, as a husband, as a businessman, as a brother, as a son. I'd failed in every department of my life. So I got hope that first night by, and I thought, maybe just maybe if I now do what he suggests, maybe just maybe I'll get what these guys who are three months and six months and one year sober, who are happy, joyous, and free, maybe I'll get what they've got. So I dusted down my big book, and I threw myself into the program with the same gusto and zeal that I'd previously reserved for my business venture, which, by the way, was now just getting deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. And I read the book this time, and, and it was like it had been rewritten since I last read it. There, there, there are passages in it that are making sense to me now, you know? And, and I went right back to the very beginning. I think what I did previously was I jumped into chapter one and ignored everything before chapter one. I certainly ignored the forewords. But, you know, in the foreword to the first edition, which I always go through with sponsees now, Bill Wilson as a salesman, it was like a sales pitch, because he says right at the beginning, he says, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body to show other alcoholics precisely how we did it is the main purpose of this book. So when I went back to the book in 2003, I went, that's what I want. Because you see, I don't have a drinking problem, but I have a serious thinking problem. I have a serious living problem. I have a serious emotional problem. I want to recover from that. I don't ever want to go back to the black depression, the slough of despond that I've lived in for years before I came back to AA. So I threw myself into the program, believing what I was hearing, that the answers to living sober are in this book. And, you know, the top of page 20 has become so, so important to me over the years. I call it my mini program. And for those of you who have arrived late in the meeting, that's the theme that I, I chose. And the, the top of page 20 says, our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depends upon our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. 
Now, I did not, see, for years, I did not think of others. The only others that I did think of were comic customers. You know, who's going to bring in the big bucks this week? Who's going to order the first edition of Amazing Spider-Man and set me up for the month? You know, the, 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 these were the only others that I was thinking of back in the day. I began to realise, though, that beyond the physical compulsion, the allergic reaction that I've got in me that I will still die with, that my main problem is described in the big book, and I think it's page 62, selfishness and self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles, right? I, as an alcoholic, I'm, a, I'm an extreme example of self-run riot, though I certainly did not think so for years. Going through with a sponsor, going through the big book, especially going through We Agnostics, blew away any lingering ideas I had that I was uh, that I was somehow atheist. So I then became an agnostic. I then have a whole chapter directed to me, addressed to me. And, and when I read the bit that says that we emphatically assure any man who is willing to believe in a power greater than himself, that he emphatically assured that he's on his way, I realised that all I had to do is become willing to believe that there was a power greater than Ivor in the universe. There had to be. Ivor had made such a mess of his life in every area. And in fact, how often do we read or, or listen to how it works? And at the end of how it works, as it was read out tonight, he even spells it out at the ABCs. It says, A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives, period, as you Americans say, right? I, I used to think that that said we could not manage our own drinking. But no, that's not what it says. Could not manage our own lives. You see, my main problem centers in here. I needed to find a new director, a new employer, to direct my thinking. My thinking was my problem. So the game changer in sobriety for me was step three. I, I approached it with some trepidation because, after all, it involves that three-letter word, G-O-D, that I had long since departed from as a teenager. But, you know, but now I'm willing to just use that as shorthand for a power greater than me. And I became willing to uh, make the decision in step three to turn my will and my life, my thoughts and my actions over to the care, the loving care of a power greater than me. And how do I do that? Well, it wasn't just the recital of a prayer, although the prayer is the articulation of the set. It was by then following up with all the actions contained in steps four through nine, and then now for several years living in steps 10, 11, and 12. And central to that was to begin to think of others, begin to see if I could help other people. I didn't think I had anything to offer, ladies and gentlemen, for years. I didn't sponsor a single soul through this 12-step program until I was 24 years sober. Note to everybody in the room who's less than 24 years sober, do not wait, okay? This is just my experience. And ever since then, that's what, 14 years ago now, I have never not sponsored somebody or tried to sponsor somebody through this 12-step program. And the amazing thing is I've now got a little battalion of sponsees in this Zoom era all over the world. It's amazing. There's, I've had more spiritual growth in the last 14 years. I've had more spiritual growth within the last two years and three months in the Zoom era than at any point previously in my journey. What I mean by that is that I have an absolute 100% faith that there is something that's greater than Ivor that I can communicate with through prayer and meditation and that by helping others, whether it is by sharing it means like this, talking to sponsees, guiding them through the 12 steps, or doing a plethora of work that I do in social media, anything and everything that I do to give of myself to another suffering alcoholic enhances my spiritual life, my spiritual growth, and serves to remind me that I do have a true purpose. You know, my primary purpose is not just to stay sober, but to help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And my very life, and most importantly of all in recent years, the quality of that life and the quality of my emotional sobriety depends upon that. I now know why I was safe from dying at the age of 25, and I make no apologies for using that terminology. I was saved. There was something intervened and saved me from dying at the age of 25, and it took me a long number of years to find out why. But I now know why. I was saved to stay sober, to become the best version of Ivor Davis that walks this earth, 
the best dad and now grandfather to two wee grandsons, the best um, sponsor, the best sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, the best neighbour, the best brother. Um, and, 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 and I'm completely comfortable in my own skin now. In essence, just to close this up, in essence, Alcoholics Anonymous and specifically the 12-step programme has done for me for real what alcohol used to give me the illusion of, you know, when you get that first drink down your night in the pub on a Friday night, and suddenly everything's okay, and you're, you're, what were you worried about anyway? That, that was all a lie, right? But Alcoholics Anonymous has, has given me for real that feeling, that feeling of ease and comfort within my own skin, that feeling of purpose in life, that feeling of fulfillment and knowing why I'm here. And uh, to be Agent Davis on a mission from God has truly been a roller coaster ride and one that I recommend to anybody in the room tonight who has not yet embarked upon our wonderful life transforming 12 step program. My number's in the chat if anybody wants to follow up by talking to me. My door is open. As a recovered alcoholic, I cannot not help anybody. That's why I'm here. Thanks very much for listening. Glad to be here. Give them sober. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.